Our Lord Jesus gave us a new commandment to love one another. When we love one another as Christ loved us, we are a new beginning. We have a fresh start. Old ways are gone. New ways have come in. And we can breathe and we can grow. And God's new mercies appear for us every day. And when we love like that, we are disciples of the loving and living Lord. Friends, as we've gathered here from many different places, on screens small and large, we gather united by faith and connected by the spirit that binds us all together in this great love of God. I'm the Reverend Jay Sandiford, and on behalf of our congregation, our session, and all our staff here at First Presbyterian Church, we are so glad that you have joined us for worship this morning. On our website, you will find almost everything you need to know about the life and ministry and programs of First Press, and we invite you to dive in and to be a part of this congregation. All our virtual services and meetings are listed online, including welcome and gatherings for people of all ages and places along life's great spectrum. There are events for youth and families, children and families. There are events for singles, adults, young and old. There's a spot here for you to click in and to be a part of the life of this community. If you need any links and you'd like to be welcome, please click on the virtual pew pads and we'll be in touch right away to show you how you might participate. Please indicate any interest that you have there on the virtual pew pads and we'll follow up. In your bulletin today, there's a comprehensive list of ways that you might be involved in service to our community and to our greater world. Links of compassion, links of service, links of care and of love. Updates and new posts are presented almost every day on our website, on our Facebook page. There's lots for you to connect with and communicate and lots of ways in which you can make a difference in our world today. Following the service, we continue to offer a virtual coffee hour at 1030. Click on the link and the Reverend Rogers will host you into a gathering of friends and conversation around the table and over a good cup of coffee. The prayer team meets each Sunday morning at 9 a.m. before worship and then follows at noon today. If you have any particular burdens or cares today, we invite you to share them with us for we cherish each and every burden and joy. Click on the link on the website and you can meet on your prayer partners at those times. And don't forget the most important part of our life together, and that is to reach out to one another in love, by phone or text or email, and be in touch with the great mercies and love of God. A special note today, there is a virtual book reading and conversation with best-selling author William Kent Kruger. He joins us for a virtual book read today at 2 p.m. via Zoom. He'll read a bit from his most recent novel, This Tender Land, and a question and answer period will follow. See the Zoom link on our website and you'll be hosted into the meeting. Today, I do have one pastoral note to share. We celebrate the life and we grieve the death of Judith Judge who died on Friday, June the 5th at home. Service plans are pending. We hold her husband Chuck and her daughters Kate and Maggie in our prayers and all who loved Judy. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who live and believe in me will never die. I now invite Susan Morville to come and to show us how to put our faith in action and to expand our generosity. In the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus feeds a hungry crowd using bread offered by a small boy. Jesus is on a hillside and he is surrounded by a great number of people. The people are hungry, starving, and a small boy offers bread. The people sit on the grass and somehow, when the boy's bread is shared, there is enough for all. And what was a crisis of sorts turns into a picnic of sorts. Much time can be spent pondering if this was a miraculous multiplication of a boy's small offering or whether his offering was the small beginning of a great generosity. At first press, breaking bread, sharing bread, gathering around a table, feeding hungry people, 
recycling good food, sharing food with a lonely neighbor are all signs of a great generosity and feeding people is one of our core values. Though the COVID-19 crisis has changed what we can do at the moment, First Press has fed people and assisted our community partners as they ensure people have something good to eat. For the last three years, I have been the coordinator of our First Press team of volunteers who prepare and serve a meal at the Delonte Center through our partnership with the Food Gatherers Community Kitchen each Wednesday evening. While most of our volunteers aren't in the kitchen or on the line serving our homeless Ann Arbor neighbors right now, they long to return to, the, to this practice of simple service. And your gifts to our Love Made Visible COVID-19 Emergency Fund help keep this vinyl ministry alive. So thank you. We know that around us, the COVID-19 crisis has changed virtually everything. It has changed lives, livelihoods, routines, and shaken our communities. And it has reshaped our life and work at First Press as we have navigated to a new digital reality. If you continue to wonder, how can I make a difference in this new reality, First Press offers a way. The session has approved a special Love Made Visible appeal in response to COVID-19 for support of two unforeseen but very real needs. First, all of us, homeless, all around us, homeless men and women are hungry. Neighbors fear the loss of their homes or apartments or businesses, and families face real health care challenges. Gifts to the Love Made Visible Fund is it, are enabling us to expand our response for these basic human needs in the Ann Arbor, Washtenaw County, and Detroit metro area. Working with our reliable community partners, your gift will feed hungry families, provide safe shelter, and create a path so that all people can receive essential health care. We have fielded requests to provide temporary shelter to families, to feed children lunch and dinner, give emergency support for food programs here in Ann Arbor and Detroit, and assistance for struggling community college students in Washtenaw County. Your gifts will make the love of God tangible and real in this moment. Our, our hope is to raise $80,000 for this part of our appeal for food, shelter, and healthcare. The second dimension of our appeal is for improved technology at First Press. Your gift to this part of the request will help to to, will help to provide an agile technology platform that will enable First Press to continue and improve live stream worship and other vital ministries such as Sunday school, study groups for adults, and digital faith formation for youth and young adults. Our hope is to raise $40,000 for this part of our appeal. You're welcome to allocate any special gift to this Love Made Visible appeal to either of these efforts or to both of them. You may give online or through the mail. Each week, I've watched our volunteers participate in this simple but important ritual of feeding hungry people. It's, for me, the beginning of a great generosity. Thank you for your generous gifts as we try to make God's love visible and real in this Pentecost season. And now reminded of all the ways that we can love and serve the Lord here, let us come to worship using the printed call to worship in your bulletin. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son for us. 
Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. If we love one another, God lives in us, and the love of God is perfected in us. There come those moments when we stand exposed, our failings, our hurtful words, our harmful ways open for all to see. But God takes these moments and these sins, redeeming them through compassion and love, making us new people, children of the living God. Let us come in these moments with our prayers to the one who waits to forgive us and make us whole. Please join me as we pray together saying, O oh God, your mercies are new every morning. As the prophets promised, you are doing a new thing among us, calling us out of old ways and habits toward a new faithfulness. And in Jesus Christ, you are endeavoring to make of us, even us, new creation. We confess before you and in the presence of one another that we have found the patterns of the past hard to lay aside, that our habits of indifference and self-concern are hard to break, that the eyes of our hearts are more accustomed to seeing what we expect than what is possible in ourselves and in one another. We ask your forgiveness for our unreadiness to go where you call us, we yearn for the renewal of your spirit, for our weariness of mind and body. 
we pray for your healing of our imaginations, that we might envision the world transformed, the human family reunited, the planet healed, the long arc of our history bending toward justice at last. Bring us to a new beginning, we pray, as we enter into the silence. Friends, God abides in you. God is breathing, living, forgiving, restoring you in this moment and in the days to come. This is the good news for us. As God is in us, we can live, work, and care for others so that love, hope, and joy might touch all people. And all God people, all God's people together are forgiven in Christ. Let the people say, Amen. Let us pray. God of mercy, you promise never to break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, speak your eternal word that does not change. Enable us to respond to your gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. The reading for today comes from the prophet Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verses 31 through 34. Hear the word of the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite now all our children and your families and even some of our big people to lean in just a little bit and hear this story again that comes from the word of our Lord. And yes, uh, for those who are curious, I have my uh, toolkit here today. I brought a couple of tools because God's given us in, in scriptures uh, like we have screwdrivers and hammers, some tools to deal with the challenges that we face each and every day. Looking around, it does seem that our world is going just a bit crazy now. A novel virus landed over us back in March, and we're suffering from a global pandemic of COVID-19. You know that people have gotten ill, including some children. Many people have died, which is a tragedy. Many important things have changed for you and for your families. School was canceled, sports ended, 
So did robotics teams and sports teams and other places where we got to go together to have fun. We can't worship now in our building here at First Pres, and it all seems sort of strange. And then there was the awful death of an African-American man in Minneapolis not long ago. It came as a result of awful mistreatment by some police officers. That inhumane death of a black man has sparked lots of real anger and protest, and it looks to be a moment of great and important change in our land. Maybe you and your family have written letters or marched in a protest or indicated your support for all the change that's unfolding now. Maybe you've marched for fair treatment of people. But into our scene steps Jesus once again. Into this moment, Jesus comes with a word for us that we have a chance to start over. It begins in Jeremiah that Zach read for us just a little bit. And it'll be a part of the passage that Pastor Rick will read in just a few minutes. In my family, we call these important moments do-overs. When we had a chance to do over something that hadn't gone well in the past. We believe that with God's great help, we could start over again. That we could take a deep breath and we could get some insight from Jesus and we could have a do-over. And so, in a way, that's what this week brings us. I brought my toolkit today because something in our house broke this week and I had to get my toolkit out and get my hammer out and do some work down in the basement. All is well now, but something had to be repaired and fixed. Things weren't going well for Jesus when he was hanging out with his disciples and the story that we'll read from John. He was kind of frustrated with them because things were just not going well. So Jesus reached into his toolkit. You know Jesus had a toolkit, don't you? And he gave his disciples and us a new tool. He gave us kindness. He reached into his toolkit of love and peace and hope and mercy and kindness and gave us a whole new tool for dealing with all the challenges that we face today. When things are going poorly and we need to start over to have a do-over, Jesus' toolkit can help us. It doesn't have the screwdrivers or pliers, but it has all that we need to deal with what comes our way. And challenges us and gives us a rough time. When other kids are mean, Jesus said, take a deep breath and be kind. Be firm. When you can't join your swim team and you have to stay home with your sister, be kind. Don't be mean. When things are out of control and your parents are upset, Jesus says, be kind. When you can't have your way, be kind not rude. Kindness, Jesus says to us today, really changes things. Jesus knew that being kind gets us out of a bad mood and fixes our relationships, and that when our world or our country, our city, our families are hurting, kindness is the tool that changes things and changes us. Kindness can fix a lot of things and people, so I hope you'll give it a try this week. Think kindness. It's the tool that Jesus gives us to fix our hearts, our minds, and our world. And if you want to follow God around in the world, remember the great words of the great prophet Micah, who reminded us that we have three tools, doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God by our side. Will you pray with me now? Dear Lord, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for your great love for all the people in the world. Thank you for being our God and for hanging out with us in the good times. Thank you even more that you stick with us when times are hard. Thank you for giving us tools like love and peace and grace. But thank you most this week for kindness, for it will surely change the world and change us. Amen. Grace and peace to you dear friends.
and kindness too. I'm Rick Spaulding. I'm the interim pastor here at First Pres at the moment. Our New Testament reading this morning comes from the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John, a story from the last 24 hours of Jesus's life. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table and took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For Jesus knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After Jesus had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, Jesus said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to others, now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Amen. Have you ever had the experience of having your feet washed? Have you ever been to a foot washing service on Monday, Thursday, or, or any other day? I find it to be one of the most powerfully intimate spiritual experiences and physical experiences that I've ever had. The church that I served in Boston held their service on the Thursday before Easter in their social hall with everyone seated around tables. That service began with a simple meal of food that you could eat just with your hands. And then the candles were lit, the lights were turned down, and the focus shifted to a semicircle of a couple of dozen chairs at one end of the room. 
after a minute or two when the silence had had a chance to settle. A few brave souls got up from their tables and went to sit in the semicircle and removed their shoes and socks. And meanwhile, slowly, a few others got up, passed through the kitchen behind the semicircle to collect a pitcher and a basin, and then came out and knelt down before someone sitting in the semicircle and took first one bare foot and then the other, placed it in the basin and poured the water gently, slowly over the toes, the arch, the bridge, the ankle, gently massaging the warm, clean water across the skin, over the tired bones, into the forgotten muscles. And one of the rules, this was Presbyterian, so of course there were rules. One of the rules was that when you'd had your feet washed and dried, you made your way through the kitchen yourself to pick up a basin and a pitcher and then came back to wash the feet of someone different who'd sat down in the semicircle in the meantime. The point was not to reciprocate the gift, not to return a favor, but to pay it forward, to let it ripple out into the world, into the room, and from there, I suppose, into the night and beyond. Now already, I bet you're a little uncomfortable thinking about those funny bumps and sensitive spots that you know so well, the hammer toe, the funny shaped nail, the odors of a long day. If you came to this service in Boston, you knew all this was gonna happen, of course. And lots of people stayed away from this service for just that reason, while others came to experience the tenderness in the room, even though they themselves couldn't quite, couldn't quite do it. Is it because the feet are the unsung heroes of the body, the awkward second cousins that lack the social graces of our hands, the expressive possibilities of our eyes and mouth, the receptivity of arms? Do we think that our feet need their privacy? Those funny looking odiferous workhorses down at the place where we touch the earth. And when someone else touches them, is it a moment of more vulnerable humanity than we're quite ready for? One year in that church in Boston, we were having a hard time on the staff. We'd just gone through the painful end of a pastorate. Hey, this is starting to sound familiar. We'd just gone through the painful end of a pastorate, and those of us who were left working together had to find a new way to begin. It wasn't easy. A few minutes after the foot washing began, I got up to take my turn, dutifully hoping that my doing so would help a few other people at least to get over their feet shyness and get the ball rolling. I sat down, leaned over to undo the laces and peel off the socks. When I looked up, there was the church administrator, my colleague, with whom I had had a stressful disagreement a day or two earlier. There he was, kneeling, pouring, massaging, drying. And at exactly this point in the story, as I'm sure you can understand, there are no more words, nothing else to say, except this. It was different after that, for a little while. Better, truer, deeper. Well, I don't know if you've ever been to a foot washing, or if you have, what it was like for you. Different, maybe. Your own experience, surely. But here's the question that I find lurking so loudly between the lines of this story about Jesus' last meal with his closest friends. How did it come to be written down only in the Gospel of John that Jesus washed their feet? It's not in Matthew or Mark or Luke. To have the teacher whom you'd come to trust 
to revere, to call master, to follow all the way to the threshold of the end, to have that person whom you knew was facing imminent moral danger lay aside his robe just like he's about to lay aside his life and kneel at your feet and wash away the dust, the ache, the weariness, maybe even some of the fear. How was that not one of the most vivid moments of gospel that you'd ever know in your life? And how would it not be the lead in the story from then on down the generations? He knelt down and washed our feet one by one, even the feet of the one who was about to betray him. That night he knelt and washed our feet and he told us to do the same for each other. How is that not our sacrament? How did we let our poor, gnarly, ugly human feet forget the experience of being held simply and tenderly and in the holding come to believe in a different part of us, a new part of us, a more hidden part that we are loved and that the love that we have received will always fill the picture that we are every time we pass through the kitchen so that we can pour it out for the cleansing and the soothing and the healing of the world. When he was done, as the Gospel of John has it, Jesus told them that he'd given them two things. One was an example. And that word example in Greek is a word that only appears in this one verse in the whole New Testament, so it kind of glows on the page. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you this remarkable, unique thing, an example that you should also do as I have done to you. And the other thing that he said he'd given them was a commandment that we love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another, he said. By this, everyone will know who you belong to if you have love for one another. He called it a new commandment. Maybe because the 10 of them that they'd all grown up with were all about respecting and honoring and doing right by each other, but none of them is quite about loving each other. Then there was the, the one, the commandment about loving your neighbor as yourself. But this was different too, because now the standard was going to be not holding your neighbor in the same regard that you hold yourself, but loving one another with the same pouring out life kind of love that he'd shown to them. A new commandment. Through the weeks of this summer here at First Pres, we're inviting you to think with us about new beginnings. Because of course, in a way, none of us expected last winter or even just three months ago, we seem to be in the midst of a new beginning. As Reverend Johnson said so powerfully last Sunday, new needs to mean that something is different, especially in a world that's filled right now with more anger than compassion, where we have reason to fear Intimate, infinitesimally small things like a virus and unimaginably huge things like the legacy of centuries of in inequality reinforced by violence. Especially in such a world, hope means to commit to each new day as though it were a fresh vessel, a pitcher of the always replenishing mercies of God, because of course it is. Since no one is quite sure what normal is anymore, it's not exactly a new normal that we're invited to consider, but it is a new thing, a new beginning, a new day that we're being invited to embrace. So what better than a new commandment? But here's the thing. The foot washing seems to have been a surprise, at least to us and maybe even to them. But the commandment to love one another is about as familiar as anything that we Christians know. How is it a new commandment anymore that we love one another as he loved us? Isn't it the one that we've had the longest and know the best? After Jesus finished washing their feet, he asked them, do you know what I've done to you? 
he needed to ask because going around the semicircle, Simon Peter, always needing to get it right and to be out front, gave him some pushback. Pulling himself up to his most dazzling humility, Peter said, you will never wash my feet. To which Jesus replied, if you don't have this experience, you won't understand what I'm inviting you into. Peter wasn't done yet though. Okay, if you're washing, wash more of me than anybody else. He wants to keep the place he imagines for himself in the center where it's safer and easier and where the rewards he imagines are greater. So sure that he already knows what a new commandment to love one another as Jesus loved us would look like. It would be no big deal at all to live that. Do you understand what I've done to you? Jesus quietly asked. Do you understand what's new about this commandment? I gave you an example. Before any words were spoken, I reminded you what it feels like to be held under the gentle pouring out of the love of God upon your weary, dusty flesh. If you'll let yourself remember what that feels like, you'll start to understand what's new about it. And you'll need to. Because this commandment is going to need to be a new one when a lot of things happen that you don't see coming. What does the new commandment to love look like, for instance, when a white man is kneeling on the neck of a black man for the four millionth time? What do you do then? What does a new commandment to love one another mean when everyone and anyone could get sick and die from just being close to each other? What does a new commandment to love one another mean when they ask you to wear a mask for the sake of others, but some people can't be bothered? What does a new commandment to love one another mean when the lobby of the state house fills up with people carrying weapons? What does a new commandment to love one another mean when an election gets canceled? What does a new commandment to love one another mean when the polar ice cap is gone, along with the coastal dwelling of nearly a billion people. On the night before he poured out his life for us, Jesus gave his friends a commandment and an example. We took the commandment. We know the words and we say them to reassure ourselves that we know what he did for us that night a new commandment that we love one another as he loved us. But we left the example behind in the basin. We let go of the memory of holding the bony odiferous flesh in the name of privacy, maybe, or in the name of privilege, or in the name at least of not feeling too vulnerable or in the name, God help us, of protecting our place as people who have enough of what we need without opening ourselves that far. We let ourselves forget what it feels like to be just another human being alongside of other human beings, each with their own tendons and cartilage and toes and breath and pulse. The words are good words. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. But he gave us more than words. He showed us how to do it, how to hold each other tenderly, respectfully, how to hold even the ones who betray us. Peter thought he already knew what it looked like to live according to the words of a commandment that we love one another. He even promised that if it came to that, he'd put his own safety on the line for the sake of his love. But we know how that came out in the courtyard a few hours later. Privilege and safety are so hard to let go of. And a lot of the time, probably a lot of us think we know too what it looks like to live this commandment. And then something happens and suddenly the commandment is new. New like it is now. New 
the way Michelle Alexander, the author of The New Jim Crow, described it in the New York Times this week. Our only hope for our collective liberation is a politics of solidarity rooted in love. In recent days, we've seen what it looks like when people of all races, ethnicities, genders, and backgrounds rise up together, standing in solidarity for justice, protesting, marching, and singing together. We've seen our faces in another American mirror, a reflection of the best of who we are and what we can become. I've glimpsed in a foggy mirror scenes of a beautiful, courageous nation struggling to be born. Then something happens and suddenly the commandment is new. Something happens and then, then maybe something will stir among our bones or between our toes and we'll remember the example. And remember, too, that we'll never already know what it looks like to love with a new commandment. Because even an ordinary morning is always new. And even an ordinary life is always precious. And even an ordinary situation is always a new beginning where the poured out love of Jesus is concerned. God help us. Amen. welcome you warmly to this virtual worship service this morning. We are so pleased that you joined us by radio or online today as a small group of musicians and pastors lead us in worship. We are a community scattered in body, but united in spirit and hope. We are determined to make God's great love not only visible, but tangible and real for all. Wherever we are, whoever we are, we are God's people, drawing our strength from our Lord's courage and compassion. We'd like to know you joined us in worship this morning. On the front page of our First Prize website, there is a button, a line that says, let us know you joined us. Click on that link and we invite you to sign a virtual cue pad 
just to let us know you are here or send us a message or a prayer request. Our prayer team receives requests regularly and prayers fervent, prays fervently for those in need. Your financial gifts make this worship possible, but more than that, your gifts make this ministry alive with the bright mercy and strong justice of Jesus Christ. Your generosity makes it possible to shape children and youth with grace and hope and to settle anxious hearts, especially in a challenging moment. You can give electronically or you may send a gift by mail or you can click on the link that says give online here. Through Jesus, God, God has shown us what it means to love and called us to follow Christ's example. Let us love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Let us offer our lives and our resources and service as we bring now our gifts to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, in the offering of our gifts, as well as the living of our days, may we not grow weary of doing what is right, but commit to speaking up for those, for those who are voiceless, healing the broken, feeding the hungry, and all those mercies which are such a part of your heart and hopes for all your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us continue in the spirit of prayer. God who loves us each beyond measure, you weep with those who weep. 
You rejoice with those who rejoice. You call us to lives of justice, faithfulness, and mercy. Hear our prayer this day as we come on another day in history of this world. With our hearts open to you, our lives laid before you, our hopes, our dreams, our sadness, and our shame all here before you. Let this day be yet another new beginning for us, O God of new mercies every morning. You are always and foremost love. As the light pierces the morning, may it likewise pierce our hearts with love. Love for the stranger, love for the neighbor, love for the wounded soul spewing hate, love for the weary souls resting, resisting the destructive forces let loose in the world. Let that love come in and settle and take over, suffocating evil, directing our words, our steps, our actions in the way that you would will for us in this world. You are ever kind and tender towards us. Even when you are clear and firm and we let you down, when your anger is kindled, when you are surely frustrated with the complacency, greed, and self-serving of we, your creatures. So let us live as you live towards us. As this day unfolds, may our souls unfold with tenderness. Tenderness for the grieving. Tenderness for the risk takers. Tenderness for the traumatized. Tenderness for the seekers. Tenderness for the lonely. Tenderness for the hard of heart. You are the source of unending joy, joy in this world that bubbles up and blossoms, even in the midst of tragedy and hardship, of sheltering, of hesitant reopening, of reunions. As the promise of new life calls us forth from our shadows, may we respond with joy. Joy for the life that awaits. Joy for the song that lifts our hearts. Joy for the healing that transforms what is broken. Joy for the courage that steadies our steps. Joy for the journey that connects us to one another. Let love, tenderness, and joy inspire us and strengthen us for this journey as we do the work to bring justice to all people. But more than that, bring our voices together, unite them in horror and anger in determination and protest for a different world now a world that we can begin to see, that we hope, that we want to see dawning, so that our voices could also be united in praise. Jesus, we pray that you will enable us to see the virus of racism and bigotry wherever it lives, and free us to challenge and uproot it from ourselves, our society, and our world. Create in us a new mind and heart that will enable us to see brothers and sisters in the faces of those divided by racial categories. Give us the grace and strength to rid ourselves of racial stereotypes that oppress some of us while providing entitlements to others. Help us to create a church and a nation that embraces the hopes and fears of oppressed people of color where we live, as well as those around the world. Let, us be, let this be our calling today and every day. We pray for medical professionals, for scientists, researchers, and all who search for a cure or vaccine for COVID-19, for the safety and well-being of all medical responders, and for those who suffer from this virus or will face it in coming days. Lord, have mercy upon us all. Heal your family, God, and make us one with you, united with you in love and tenderness and ultimately Enjoy. This we pray through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Dear friends, our service now begins. So may you find a way to go forth into the world and take what you have received from these moments of worship, whatever you have received of peace, of hope, of joy, and plant them in the waiting furrows of the world that they may bear the fruit that God intends, the fruit of justice, the fruit of mercy and kindness, the fruit of hope. And as you go, let the commandment of Jesus hold your bones. Let the memory of Jesus stir your feet. For he said to us, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than to lay down life for friends. You are my friends, he said, if you do what I ask you. So let us go forth. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord's own hands hold your weary feet the light of the Lord's countenance be lifted up upon you and give you peace this day, this night, and even forevermore. Amen. Amen.